Hey, well, very, very warm welcome. Uh, as Dave said, uh, if you're a guest, a visitor, if you're watching online, really, really warm welcome to Hope Church. Uh, now, today is Palm Sunday. Some of you may know that, some of you may not, but today is Palm Sunday, uh, and it's the start of Holy Week. Uh, and Holy Week uh, is the events of Easter beginning today, Palm Sunday leading through to Good Friday when Jesus was crucified on the cross, and then Easter Sunday when Jesus rose again. Interestingly, uh, almost uh, half of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are taken up with the events of Passion Week. So the final week of Jesus' life, Almost half of the Gospels are about what goes on in that final week. It's a third, over a third of Matthew, a third of Mark, two-fifths of Luke, and almost exactly half of the Gospel of John. So all of the Gospels mention the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, triumphal entry. It's a passage we're going to look at in a moment. When Jesus, on a donkey, rides into Jerusalem. Now, I was thinking this week, preparing this message about donkeys. As you'll see a bit later, donkeys are actually really, really important. Uh, the fact that Jesus chose a donkey to ride into Jerusalem was very, very significant. But I was just having a little bit of fun, and I thought, oh, I don't know much about donkeys. You know, obviously, you often ride a donkey at the seaside. Uh, but, you know, what, what? let me find out some fun facts about donkeys. So here you go. Just a few of my favorite fun facts about donkeys. A donkey's favorite pastime is to roll around on the ground. Apparently, I don't know how they found that out, but uh, that's what all the um, research says. Favorite thing a donkey does, roll around in the grass. Donkeys don't like being in the rain for long periods of time because their fur is actually not waterproof. Unlike many other animals, their fur is not waterproof. A healthy donkey can live into their 50s. So you get very old donkeys, been around a while. Um, donkey's ears can hear for up to two miles. A, a donkey braying, I'm not going to, you know, that nay, the kind of bray, whatever donkey's bray sounds like. But a donkey's bray can be heard for up to 50 miles in a desert. I don't know how they work these things out, but apparently that's what the internet says. Um, Donkeys are a calming influence over other animals. And here's my favorite, last one. Here's my absolute favorite. More people in the world die from donkey-related accidents than in airplane crashes every year. I mean, how? So when you get on an airplane, you're like, whoa, I'm really glad I'm sitting in my airplane and not on a donkey. You know? How about that? So donkeys are much more dangerous than flying to, you know, on holiday or flying to go and visit some relatives or something. There you go. Just a few little fun facts about donkeys, which is incredibly significant, as we'll find out a little bit later. So the context of the passage we're about to read is that it's Passover in Jerusalem. And uh, pilgrims have come from all over to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, the Passover was a celebration of the Jewish past when God, sep God uh, took the Israelites out of Egypt and into freedom and into the promised land. And the pilgrims and people from all over the world were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and the place where God dwelt. Because at that time, 2,000 years ago, God dwelt in the temple. And it was a time of great singing, of great celebration, of dancing and feasting. And there was a real anticipation in the minds of Jesus' followers. Jesus' followers had been in Jericho. And if you know anything about that, the promised land, you know anything about the holy land, Jericho is kind of down here. And then the trip up to Jerusalem is up a winding path, up high. So the, 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 the followers of Jesus, the disciples, had been with Jesus for three years. And things were bubbling, and there was a sense of anticipation. And they were on their way from Jericho up to Jerusalem. Something was about to happen. You could just sense it. 
Jesus was about to do something. Something was about to kind of expire. Something was about to kind of, kind of kick off. They could feel it and they could sense it. So it was Passover on the 10th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. Let's read from John's gospel. We could have picked any gospel. We're going to read from John's gospel, chapter 12 uh, and verses 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, that's Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. That's quoted from uh, Zechariah 9 verse 9. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. But only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. What I want to do today is look at three life lessons from a donkey ride. Three things that we can learn from Jesus' ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. Number one, Jesus Christ is more appealing than religion. We can see in verse 12 and verse 13. The people in Jerusalem went out to meet Jesus. You've got to understand, this was a religious crowd. There was three main festivals in Judaism. There was Passover, there was Pentecost, and there was the Feast of Tabernacles. They were the three key Jewish festivals. And the religious people had all come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the coming out of slavery, when God kind of freed his people back in Exodus. This is one of the focal points of Jewish history. But you see, every year the rituals were exactly the same. Every year the root and the practices and the patterns of Passover were exactly the same. The prayers that were prayed, the roots that were walked, everything, the stories that were told. And what we see here in John and all the Gospels is that the people in Jerusalem, they wanted something more and they were drawn to Jesus. They found out that Jesus was in town, so they gravitated towards him. And what did the crowd shout? We read it, verse 13. They shouted, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna means save us now. That's what they were shouting. The crowds were shouting to Jesus. They, they'd gone to Jesus and they were shouting, Hosanna, save us now. Now, they had a bit of a misunderstanding, the crowds. They, they, they thought that Jesus was going to kind of drive out the Romans. Their misunderstanding was that they thought that Jesus saving them meant that the Romans would be defeated and that they would have a victory and a liberation like the Jews did back in Egypt. But what they really needed was for Jesus to deal with their sin and shame and guilt and mess and die on the cross for all mankind. That was what would save them. So when they were shouting, Hosanna, save us now, there was a slight misunderstanding with what they were shouting, but their hearts were drawn to Jesus. They saw something in Jesus that was appealing. They saw something in Jesus that they didn't see in the stale and stagnant religion. You see, Jesus was like fresh air to them. We saw it we see all the time in the Gospels, crowds are drawn to Jesus. Why? Because there's something about him that is different to religion. There is something about Jesus that people are drawn to. In Mark 12 and verse 37, it says something very interesting. It says, the common people heard him, that's Jesus, gladly. 
In other words, the crowds, the people just couldn't get enough of Jesus. They didn't want this stuffy, predictable rules of religion, but they were drawn to Jesus. And you know what? That is equally true today in 2023. People are fascinated and intrigued by Jesus. They don't like religion. They see the problems that religion creates, but they are drawn to the person of Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi famously said, I am fascinated and love Jesus Christ, but I do not love your Christians. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. And you can see it all through history that even people who who are not followers of Christ, they're not actually Christians, but they are fascinated by the person of Jesus Christ. Christ. People are drawn to Jesus. There's something about Jesus which is vibrant. There's something about Jesus which is dynamic. There's something about Jesus which is magnetic. In in fact, people don't know what to do with Jesus. They, they, They can kind of, they can slander kind of religion and they can slander Christianity all they like, but they don't know what to do with Jesus, because Jesus is so fascinating and magnetic and dynamic, and he doesn't fit in a box, and he spends time with with outcasts, and yet he speaks truth, and there's something about Jesus. So what I want to do is I want to show you something, help you. What are the main differences between religion and Jesus? Four things. This, I think, will really help you. Number one, Religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasizes the inward. You see, Jesus says, why are you thinking evil thoughts in your heart? Jesus says, out of your heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, I'm interested in your heart. I'm interested in the inward. Religion is all about the outward behavior. It's all about what you do. It's all about how you behave. It's about how you look and conduct yourself. It's about how much money you might give. It's about how many acts of kindness you would do a day or a week. It's about the outward behavior. But Jesus is about the heart. He's about the inside. Let me just read one scripture that just illustrates this uh, phenomenally. Matthew 23 And verse 26, listen to what um, Jesus says here. He says, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate. The outside then may also be clean. Get the order right, Pharisees. Clean the inside first and then come to the outside. The Pharisees were interested in the outside of the cup. Jesus was interested in the inside of the cup. Religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasizes the inward. That's the first thing. Second difference between religion and Jesus. Religion is often about what you can't do. Jesus is about what you can do. In other words, religion is thou shalt not. Religion is, well, what we are against. Jesus is come as you are and see what you can do. Because with me, in Christ, all things are possible. Let me come with you on a relationship with me, with Jesus Christ, and show you life in all its fullness. And you see, the problem is so many Christians live with a religious mindset, religious glasses, because all they see is the things you can't do. All they are focusing on is the do not do, thou shalt not do. Jesus comes along and overturns that table and smashes that and says, no, 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 with me, It's about a life of adventure. It's about what you can do. It's about the possibilities of what I can show you. It's about your life and life in all its fullness. Religion is about what you cannot do. In Christ, it's about what we can do. All things are possible through Christ who dwells in me. Third thing, religion puts 
up barriers. Jesus pulls down barriers. This is, this is massive. Let me give you one example from Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. If you and I rocked up to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, as Gentiles, there was places that we could not go. Let's take the temple in Jerusalem, the holy temple, where there was the holy of holies, the place where God dwelt. You and I, Gentiles, we would be on the outer courts. We'd be miles away from the holy of holies. If you were a Jewish woman, you were one court closer. If you were a Jewish man, you were another court closer. If you were a high priest, you were another court closer. And then the high priest, the one who was picked by lots once a year, could go into the holy of holies. In other words, there are barriers left, right, and center. Barriers everywhere. Courts and walls to keep people out. And that's what religion does. Religion puts up barriers. It says, you don't look right. It says, you've got a terrible past, so you can't come to God. You know, that's what religion does. It says, well, your language is still a bit foul. So because your language is still a bit foul, you, you can't come to God. You can't come to God's holy of holies. You can't come to his presence. Jesus smashes all those barriers. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you. There's, there's no barriers. It's a, it's a flat path. Come to me. And he goes even further than that, which blew the Pharisees and the people at the time's minds when he says, come to me, little children. Come to me. Come to me with just your, 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 your childlike faith. Come to me. So religion puts up barriers, left, right, and center. It still does it today. Jesus smashes those barriers, pulls down those barriers, and says, come to me. Final one. There are probably more, but final one. Religion says, work your way to God. Jesus says, come to me. Grace is a gift. Come to me. Grace is a gift from God. Let me, let me give you this illustration, which I find incredibly helpful. You know, uh, years and years ago, I taught RE for a number of years in secondary school. And I'm more than happy to teach about Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism because I'm really happy because they're so different from Christianity. And this is the illustration I would often give to show you how different they are. You see, every world religion agrees that mankind is in a pit, is in trouble, has messed up. So if you imagine I'm in a pit, these walls of the pit, I cannot get out on my own. I am stuck in my sin. I'm stuck in my mess. Every single world religion agrees with that and believes that. But every world religion has, says, you then, I, you, me, then has to try to work our way to God. Judaism says, well, there's the Ten Commandments, and there's the 613 laws of the Old Testament. And if you try and follow them, you're going to try and get your way out of the pit and get your way and work your way to God. Islam says, well, there's the five pillars of Islam. Follow those five pillars and maybe, just maybe, you might be able to climb to Allah and you might be able to placate Allah and you might be able to turn the scales. But you have to work your way to God. Hinduism says it's about your good works, it's about reincarnation, it's about being good, and it's about working your way out. And you go through all the world religions, and all of them are based on you or I working our way to God. Christianity says, impossible. You and I, we cannot work our way to God. You can't. You start, you have a good couple of days, you get halfway up, climbing up the pit, and then you have a bad day, back down in the foot of the pit. But you see, we have a Savior whose name is Jesus. And Jesus, the picture I like to give, I used to teach uh, with the students was, imagine then a helicopter comes along, and a guy kind of comes down on a winch, 
and his hand is there, and he lays out his hand to you and says, put my hand in yours, trust me, and I will take you out of your pit and put your feet on solid ground. That's the gift of grace. That's the gift of Jesus Christ. And you see, religion says, do, 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 do. Jesus says, it is done. It is finished. On the cross, it is finished once and for all. Receive the gift. Receive the gift, the grace of of God. So can you see how, how different Christianity, you know, and G, following Jesus is to religion? How, how different Jesus is to religion? So when the crowd are shouting, save us, save us, when Jesus dies on the cross, that is what he does for us. He made it possible for us to have a personal relationship with God. I love what it says in verse 19. You know, the Pharisees say, the Pharisees say that the whole world can now come to Jesus. They are almost there prophesying what is to come through Jesus dying on that cross. So the first lesson, the first lesson is that Jesus is more appealing than religion. Second lesson, scripture is more reliable than opinions. Verse 14, John 12, verse 14, it says that the king is sitting on a donkey. Jesus finds a young donkey and sat on it. Verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. That's John quoting Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Now, many people have opinions, don't they, in this world? People have opinions. Left, right, and center, they're happy to give you their opinions. When Jesus was alive, people had a lot of opinions about him. Some say he's Elijah. Some say he's a prophet. Some say, well, he must be from the devil because of the things that he does. Today, people have opinions about Jesus. They say, oh, well, he's just a prophet like Muhammad. Or they'll say, well, yeah, Jesus, he was just a good man. Or, well, Jesus, I'm not even sure whether he existed. John quotes scripture. So he wants us to understand that he is quoting something that is from the Old Testament. And there's a reason why he's doing this. Because whatever opinion you might have about Jesus, he wants to tell us what Scripture says about Jesus. And you see, Scripture is incredibly reliable. Again, let me just give a big plug for Alpha. There's a great session in Alpha which goes through the reliability of the Bible, the reliability of Scripture. Do you know, the Bible is the most reliable, historically accurate kind of ancient document that we have. If you compare the reliability of Scripture alongside things like Caesar's Gaelic Wars or the Iliad or all these like kind of historical accounts, then the Bible knocks the socks off them all in terms of the amount of documents and evidence available, in terms of the time lapse between the events happening and the documents that we have. Scripture kind of is hugely reliable from all of the logical, historical kind of parameters that we would use to judge whether something is reliable. The Bible stands up. The Bible is reliable. So again, that's a wonderful section in Alpha, which explores that. And there's great questions and great content that you can learn. But you see, Scripture is God's revelation that we can trust. But let me ask you a question. Why, why a donkey? Why did Jesus come on a donkey into Jerusalem? I wonder if you ever thought that or wondered that. It's interesting that commentators say because the crowds were so big in Jerusalem at Passover, 
Jesus could never have addressed them vocally. You know, there was no sound systems back then. And yes, they used to teach on mountain sites. But there were so many people in a thronging city that Jesus couldn't teach them. So what does he do? He uses an object. He uses something visually, and he teaches them visually. He teaches them by what they see. Because, you see, kings rode on a donkey in times of peace. So there's one other example in uh, the Old Testament. King Solomon, at the time of the consecration of the temple, the time of peace in Israel, one of the time, greatest time of peace in the nation of Israel, and Solomon rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. So kings rode on donkeys in times of peace. But kings rode on horses in times of war. That's why in Revelation 19, Jesus will return on a white horse when he will come in judgment and the end of the world will come. But here, 2,000 years ago, Jesus is riding on a donkey. He is coming offering peace. You see, the donkey is carrying the savior of the world to begin the journey to die on the cross, to create peace for you and I with God in heaven. And the donkey is another symbol of the reliability of scripture because the prophecy that John quotes was from 500 years before the event took place. So Zechariah's prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah, would come into Jerusalem on a donkey, that prophecy was written down 500 years before it happened. But let's, let's delve a little bit deeper into this, the reliability of Scripture. I mentioned to you that all four Gospels talk about the triumphal entry. In Luke's Gospel, After the triumphal entry, we get a little bit more detail because we read there what Jesus says after the triumphal entry. So Luke 19, I haven't got it up on the screen, I'm just going to read it to you. Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. And when he drew near, that's Jesus, and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, would that you... Even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and will hem you in on every side. They will tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave. One stone upon another will be unturned because you did not know the time of your visitation. So what's happening here? Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. He's just come on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the donkey. He's now weeping over Jerusalem. And in those verses, verses 43 and 44, he predicts the fall, the destruction of Jerusalem. And historically, that happens 40 years later in 72 AD. Titus leads a Roman victory onto Jerusalem. 600,000 Jews are killed. You can read the historical accounts. It talks about rivers of blood in Jerusalem. And the temple is destroyed. It breaks God's heart. And you see, what Jesus is doing is he is seeing into the future and his heart is broken because he knows what is going to happen. So again, we can see here the reliability of Scripture. We can see here that we can trust God's Word because what Jesus said came to pass 40 years later. But let's go deeper one more, okay? So, so far we've got Zechariah's prophecy 500 years before, which came true. Jesus rode on a donkey, the Messiah, into Jerusalem. And then we've got Jesus' words in Luke 19, when he tells that of Jerusalem's destruction, which 40 years later becomes a reality when the temple is destroyed. But let's go one one kind of further level deeper. In Daniel chapter 9, 
There is another prophecy. Again, I'm just going to read it to you. This could be good. We could look at unpacking this for ages, but I'm just going to read it to you. Daniel chapter 9, another prophecy that comes, verses 26 and 27. Of, I'll start from 25, actually. 25, 26, and 27. It's a prophecy that Daniel has. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the world to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then, for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until a decreed end is poured out on the desolate. Now, a lot there to unpack. If you want to go to, into this in great detail, the book to go to is a book called The Coming Prince. It's about 100 years old. And interestingly, it was written by a man called Sir Robert Anderson, who was both a Christian and the head of Scotland Yard. And, and he, he went into lots of different scriptures to look at the timing and the reliability of the prophecies that are written in scripture. As I say, you can go into this in great detail. In that book, it's available online as a PDF because it's kind of an old book, so you can, you can read it uh, online for free. But there's huge research and detail that he goes to. But let me boil it down to this. This is what I want to boil it down to. He boils it down to this. So that prophecy talks about the restoring of Jerusalem. Now that takes place in 445 BC. Remember, this is the Old Testament. When Nehemiah goes to Ark to Xerxes in Nehemiah 2 and verse 5 and asks to rebuild Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is rebuilt. And then you get all the mathematics, which I'm not going to go through, but if you want to, go to that PDF, The Coming Prince, Sir Robert Anderson. And he talks you through there all the mathematics and the timing of those verses. And basically, okay, you've got seven times 69 prophetic years. And a prophetic year or a lunar year is not 365 days that we know, but 360 days. And if you do the mathematics, that comes out 173,880 days. So remember the date, 40, 445 BC. Add 173,880 days later, you get to the 6th of April, 32 AD, or the 10th day of Nisan in the Jewish Passover. In other words, you get to the day that Jesus came on a donkey into Jerusalem. That Daniel's prophecy is fulfilled to the precise day. There's not only the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which happened under, Jerem uh, under Nehemiah, sorry, but all the days later, to the T, to the exact number, you have the Messiah coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then the prophecy goes on about what happens next. The point I'm making here is the faithfulness of God's word, the reliability of scripture. We've looked at three things. The Zechariah prophecy, we've looked at Jesus' words about the destruction of Jerusalem, and Daniel's prophecy about the days, the gap between Jerusalem being rebuilt and Jesus, the Messiah, coming on a donkey. And all of them add up. All of them show us the faithfulness and confidence we can have in God's word. One more thing. Up until this point, if you read the Gospels, when Jesus does miracles, he says to his disciples, shh, don't tell anyone. He doesn't want the news to get out. 
Shh, not the time yet. Countless times, you can read it in the Gospels. He does this great miracle. Someone's healed. The 5,000 are fed. Something incredible happens. The demon's cast out. And he's like, shh, not yet time. But now, this is the moment, the triumphal entry. Jesus, the king on the donkey, when he is presenting himself to the Jews and to the world, as the one who fulfills the prophecies of Zechariah, the prophecies of Daniel. He is the one who is the king. He is the one who is to bring peace between God and mankind. And, and one last thing before we um, go on to the third point, the third life lesson. I find it really interesting, verse 16. It talks about there, verse 16, if you look in John uh, and verse 16, the John passage we're reading, John chapter 12 and verse 16. It says there, then the disciples remembered. In other words, they didn't get it when Jesus was on the donkey walking into Jerusalem. They didn't get it. They got it only at a later date. You know, John is writing this after the event. He is writing about what happened. So he is kind of telling us, look, the disciples didn't get it when it happened, but then they had the revelation. Then it made sense. Listen, I, I want to encourage you all. You can breathe a huge sigh of relief if sometimes you read scripture and you're like, I don't, I don't get it. 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 You know, you can breathe a huge sigh of relief because, you know, there will come a point if you persevere, you keep reading scripture, you keep coming under the sound of God's word, when suddenly you'll go, oh, now it makes sense. Oh, now I can piece those things together. Oh, now I've got revelation from God about what that means. You see, the disciples went back and they understood and they saw and it made sense. So listen, opinion. <laughs> opinion is here, there, and everywhere. But this is what is reliable. This is what we can trust. Scripture, God's word, it stands the test of questions. It stands the test of scrutiny. Honestly, I tell you, it does. Try it. Your big questions, your doubts, come to Scripture and see what happens. Because Scripture is more reliable than opinions. Final life lesson. Following Jesus is a choice we all need to make. So there were four groups there that day. John tells us there was four groups there, four different groups of people at the triumphal entry. It's a kind of a, a trait that, that John uses when writing the Gospels. He uses this trait of describing different groups that are watching Jesus or engaged in what Jesus is doing. And then he gives different perspectives on how they are reacting. Here we have four groups that are engaged in the triumphal entry. We have verse 16, the disciples, who, who are learners and followers. We have verse 17, we have eyewitnesses who had seen uh, Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They'd seen Jesus do miracles. We then have verse 18, others who have heard from the eyewitnesses, although that they weren't there themselves. And then verse 19, we have religious leaders. We have the Pharisees. And you see, they all saw the same event. They all saw Jesus on a donkey riding into Jerusalem. They all saw the same thing. But only the disciples were true followers of Jesus. And they followed Jesus through tough times and difficulties. They followed Jesus through pain and suffering. As we know, apart from the Apostle John who wrote Revelation, all of the other disciples were martyred. They, they died for their faith and trust in Jesus. They were followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the final point I want to bring home. You see, it's good to have questions. It's good to observe. It's good to read Scripture. I would encourage you all, if you haven't, to do an Alpha course. These are good things to do, to study, to read, to question, to engage. But there comes a point when for all of us, we need to answer the question, am I a true follower of Jesus Christ? Or am I just an observer? 
Am I just someone on the outside who will watch, who will hear of the things that Jesus has done? Or will I engage and follow him in the ups and the downs of life? Will you follow me? Jesus says. In all those different groups there that day in Jerusalem, it was only the disciples who were true followers of Jesus Christ. So donkeys, for me, have taken on a bit of a different perspective this week. Donkeys fulfill scripture, promises, prophecies, and timings. Let me give one final use of a donkey in ancient times and in scripture. You see, a donkey was often sent ahead to appease an enemy. So if you had a beef with someone, getting down with the kids, if you'd had a beef with someone, if you had an argument, a fight with someone, you'd done something to kind of get on their nerves, there was a serious fight between your families or whatever, then one of the things in the ancient times that you would do is you would laden a donkey with food and gifts and send the donkey on ahead of you to appease your enemy for the wrong that you have done. It's what Jacob did in Genesis 33. He had an argument with his brother, Jacob and Esau. And so what does Jacob do? He's nervous about beating his brother. He he packs a bunch of donkeys in Genesis 33 with presents and gifts and food and, and sends it on ahead of him to Esau to placate his brother, to appease the wrath of his brother. The other example is in 1 Samuel um, verse, uh, chapter 23, when uh, Abigail sends uh, donkeys laden with food and treasures to stop King David killing her family because of her husband's wrongdoing with David. And so she sends these donkeys laden with food and treasures ahead of her to appease King David. Palm Sunday is this beautiful picture of a donkey carrying Jesus, the living sacrifice, the perfect, spotless sacrifice that would satisfy the wrath of God. The donkey is Jesus goes before us so that we then might have perfect peace and relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. In a minute, we're going to break bread together and have communion as part of our response and as part of worship. But just before we do that, let me give two challenges to finish. The first one is this. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ today, I believe that there is a moment for you to say, today, I will follow Jesus. Maybe you've observed, maybe you've watched, maybe you've come to church with someone and you're here observing and watching. That is great, wonderful. But there comes a moment when Jesus asks you, will you follow me? Will you leave your nets and will you follow me? So the first challenge is, if that's you and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would challenge you and encourage you to do that today. The second thing I would say is, As Christians, as believers, let's be confident in God's word and let's enjoy the adventure of following Jesus. Because Jesus is different to religion. Jesus is a life that is dynamic and an adventure and a relationship with the living God, built on the certainty and the reliability of Scripture.